Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Tamisha Price Brock, and I would like to thank you for joining in on my session, Transforming Music Education, Repaving the Road from Enrollment to Commencement. Whether you're joining us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live, I thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to chime into this important conversation. We're gonna jump right in. This is a repeat of a session I did last month for the American Association of Blacks in Higher Education. Areas of focus in this presentation today will be recruitment and retention, curriculum, capstone requirements, career and advanced study readiness, advising and tracking graduates and alumni. The goals of this session are to spark essential dialogue regarding the need for reform in our college and university music degree programs, especially at our HBCUs, and to highlight current issues in HBCU music degree programs. I also want to generate interest in forming a task force to research and offer a strategic plan for program reform. Here are a few points to ponder. Historically black colleges and universities are home to some of the largest performing ensembles in the nation, yet many of the students participating in our ensembles are non-music majors. Our music departments are bustling with musical activity from our marching and concert bands, concert and gospel choirs and jazz bands, which provide a wide array of opportunities to pursue a career in music. However, many of our majors often face challenges with curriculum and capstone requirements, transitioning to graduate study and finding employment after graduation. These challenges prompt many to change their major or deter them from entering the profession at all. Did you know that there's an alarming decline of music majors in our college and university programs and a continued shortage of music teachers nationwide? In a 2021 study, 32 states, along with the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands reported a shortage of music teachers between 2011 and 2012 and the 2020-2021 school years. This first activity is meant to be interactive. So if you um, have something to write with, please do feel free to chime in on Facebook or on Zoom. But I want you to think about recruitment and retention. Uh, I feel that this session is so important that um, it shouldn't just be a presentation from me. I definitely welcome dialogue and you can feel free to write your thoughts down and we can um, dialogue via open chat on Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook, feel free to add it to the chat. But let's talk about recruitment and retention. We're talking about recruitment, enrollment, and retention. Think about the first question I have here. What do you feel are the key critical factors that influence or impact student success from enrollment to commencement? So what, what things do you feel determine whether a student is going to be successful from the time they step foot on your campus to the time they walk across that stage and receive their degree? In addition to this question, think of some examples of current recruitment and retention practices at your institution or within, within your department. Who does majority of your recruiting? Is it your large ensemble directors? Is it your department chair? Is it a representative for your department specifically hired for recruitment? Or is everyone all hands on deck? Does everyone in your department play a role in recruitment? So think about, think about keep um, factors that influence or impact student success, and then examples of um, what you currently do at your institutions or what you know, what you witness at your institutions um, as far as recruitment and retention. And I'll give a moment again, um, you can openly um, talk about this, you know, by unmuting yourself if you're on Zoom, or you can place your answers in the chat. And in the chat on Facebook, I'm saying my biggest thing with music degree programs is the disconnect between the modern world and what is considered education to prepare you for this world. I definitely agree. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about in our presentation today is um, the whole thing that prompted this. We have to look at whether or not what we're doing is relevant to today's needs, today's students, and today's workforce. Um, in the conference that I presented at last month, um, during the president's panel, they mentioned, is our current business model for education relevant and effective to what's actually happening in the real world? And for majority of the people on that call, the answer was an alarming no. 
Um, everyone understands there's a need for change. However, many of us are either, uh, we feel that the task is too large for us to, um, to conquer ourselves. We don't know where to start. Or, you know, we're, we're stuck with a sense of complacency where, you know, we're just going to follow the norm and just continue business as usual. Um, again, in the chat, I see retention doesn't work with inflation. Yeah, inflation of tuition costs, um, things continuing to rise can definitely impact retention. But there are some things I'm sure we can do uh, within our department and at our institutions to kind of help make sure um, our students are um, making it, you know, year to year and that we don't lose them at the freshman year. So we'll definitely talk about that as well. And yeah, I definitely agree. Um, came to school with a full ride and by the second semester prices went up and the cost of school went up 12,000 in seven years. I definitely agree. I remember when I applied to Virginia State University over 20 years ago, my tuition was probably $9,000 a year, roughly over 9,000 a year. Um, nowadays, I wanna say Virginia State is about 18,000 a year, maybe a little bit more. It's a quality education, but I definitely agree. I've witnessed the change and the increase in tuition at a lot of our um, schools for their undergraduate programs. So I can definitely attest to that. Okay, um, let's move forward. Um, if you have anything like um, additional, feel free to add it in the chat. Or if you're on Zoom, feel free to use the raise your hand button so that um, you know we can go from there as far as um, answering your questions. Let's look at recruitment and retention up close. For recruitment, I am an advocate um, of partnering with our K-12 schools. Let's think about how we recruit now. Think about what you remember seeing um, when you were in high school, what you um, noticed now, what you've heard from students. Many of the times when our universities recruit at the high schools, they will go in um, after making contact with the guidance counselor, they may set up a table during the in the cafeteria during the lunch period or in the library or in the common area of the school. I definitely, being a K-12 teacher now, um, I can definitely tell you that is no longer effective um, with lunch periods being shorter and shorter. And especially during a time where the pandemic had a lot of lunch periods on lockdown, students are more concerned about being able to get their meal or standing in long lines than making it over to a table. They have to weigh, do I eat lunch? Do I go get this brochure? Do I eat lunch? Do I talk to this recruitment counselor? So what I propose to kind of be a little bit more effective with recruitment, in addition to reaching out to guidance counselors, we know that's always our go-to um, source in our school systems. I encourage you to reach out to the people who actually see our seniors more throughout the school year than our guidance counselors do. They will be our graduation coaches, our senior class sponsors, and our activity and ensemble directors and coaches. They're going to have a greater amount of interaction on a daily or weekly basis with our seniors than the guidance counselors will. Many a times our guidance counselors only see our seniors when it comes to doing their graduation audit, presenting people such as college fairs or Jostens or Herf Jones when it comes to class rings and things like that, or making sure students have taken the SAT or the ACT. However, your class sponsors are gonna interact the, with them on a monthly or bi-monthly basis as they're preparing for various meetings, senior class activities, and um, definitely um, getting them ready for college and getting them to think about things after college. So I highly encourage you to reach out to more than just the guidance counselors at our K-12 schools. On campus opportunities, um, I learned a long time ago from a very good professor at UNC Greensboro that the more you get students exposed to your campus, the more your campus is gonna be in the forefront of their mind. You want to create multiple opportunities for your potential recruits to come onto your campus, more so than just open house or orientation. You want to create special events geared towards getting your future on campus. You want to have workshops and symposiums, invite them to concerts, um, invite high school programs if you are a music director, invite them to do a showcase and perform on your campus, offer free music lessons in your department, offer a free athletics day. Um, where they can come out and interact with your team. 
the more you can get students on your campus throughout the year, the more they're going to become number one. You're going to become number one in their mind when they're looking at where to go to further their education. So I encourage you to look at revamping the on-campus opportunities you currently offer. Um, your open house, make it a more holistic experience. I know we do tours, we have different people presenting at our open houses, but what are we doing to really benefit our departments at the open house? And this is something I'll talk about further later too, is given the opportunity to have them do a full walkthrough of your department as a part of the open house and having a segment where you talk to those who are interested in majoring in something in your department to give them all of the information up front so that they can make a more informed decision when they decide, when they declare their major prior to enrollment. Print and social media. How are we using our websites? I will say one of the things that has posed a challenge for us in this generation is that we are often behind the times with keeping our websites current, making them easily accessible and easily uh, easy to navigate. Um, many of our schools have webmasters and I'm just going to say it. Why are we paying webmasters if our websites are not going to be up to date and fully functional? We have to really consider who we have in those positions because that is how we communicate with this generation. They want to be able to go to a website, pull the information, make it easily accessible. So I definitely encourage you to consider revamping how we advertise through print and social media for as far as recruitment is concerned. Um, I've been on several university websites and I'll just leave it there where it's surface information only. Links are broken, information is outdated. You cannot find, you cannot easily click and navigate to people you need to contact if you want to know more about their departments. So it's very important that we consider this and that we include that as a regular part of our conversation in our departmental meetings and that someone from our department serves as a representative or liaison to work closely with your university webmaster to make sure your information is easily accessible and up to date for your potential recruits. Utilize TV, cable, and satellite broadcasting. There are many free channels in your community that you can use to get the word out there. And that is a great way to communicate with your parents as well. We all know we can give students something when we meet them at the high school, but it, it may never leave the school to make it home to their parent. So you want to create multiple ways to get to the parents who are ultimately helping to make the decision when it comes to finances and where their students go after graduation. In regards to retention, advising and mentoring, it's a big thing we need to revamp in our programs. It is beyond meeting our students twice a year to help them figure out their schedules for the next semester. Your mentor, your advisor, is a, plays a key role in your retention and your success through the matriculation of your program. It is very important that your advisors and mentors are readily knowledgeable about what you need to do to complete your degree, but also up to date and current with the current um, demands of the workforce. Your advisor and mentor should regularly be talking to you about capstone requirements, whether it is placement exams, licensure exams, uh, graduate school admissions and requirements, and what the current um, temperature of the workforce is. What are the current salaries? Where, where are the jobs? Where are the internships? These are things that are important for an advisor and mentor to communicate with the students to increase retention, but also make sure they are wholly prepared by the time they graduate to actually enter the workforce. Publicity and support in the campus and home communities. A lot of the times, uh, students like to be recognized for their hard work. If you're doing a performance somewhere or if you have a student from a particular hometown that has excelled academically, you will want to um, broadcast that and publicize that. Send a, send a press release back to their hometown newspaper. Send a press release to their, the high school they graduated from. The more students see people like them, people from their community and people from their own high schools doing well at your institutions, the more it's gonna spark an interest 
and more people from that school and that community come into your institution. So, you know, kind of toot the horn, shout out your students when they've excelled and made the dean's list. Make sure that the news doesn't just stop in your campus newspaper, but it makes it back to that student's home community via the web, via print media, or via a simple email back to their guidance counselor or principal so that they can include that good news in their morning announcements. Once again, the more people see that people from their own community are doing well at your institution, you're gonna to start to generate a natural pipeline for yourself, not only for recruitment, for, but for people to stay until they graduate. So it's gonna help improve retention. Peer cohorts or mentor groups. A lot of our students, and I saw this in a chat on, face, on Facebook a few minutes ago, talking about our first generation students needing way more attention. We have to provide a support group. A lot of our students are away from home and away from their comfort zone for the first time in their lives. And the establishment of a peer cohort to kind of make sure they're all going to class on time, doing their homework, or just a cheering section for each other, or mentor groups. Are, um, I believe that would be extremely beneficial to making sure we retain students beyond freshman year. If you notice, when we have conversations about retention, you read reports about retention, it's a lot of emphasis placed into freshman to sophomore year retention, but we don't always track very well sophomore to junior year, junior to senior year, and senior year to commencement. A lot of times we have the false notion that if a student has made it to senior year, they're good to go and they're going to make it. We don't account that a lot of our seniors never make it to the stage for commencement. They may start the fall semester, but something happens in the spring and it's beyond the cliche of senioritis. It's something happens in the spring where they never make it to commencement. And we have to do a better job of making sure we retain students at each stage of their matriculation, not just from freshman to sophomore year. So peer cohorts and mentor groups, I feel, would be extremely successful in this effort. Establish an at-risk program and a 3.0 club or incentive program. Have a program in place in your department and at your institution, but especially at the departmental level, to uh, be proactive um, and not just reactive when you have students who are at risk of flunking out for that semester. You'll want to have uh, advisors or mentors or faculty who are dedicated to working with your at-risk students. You may even wanna include some of your um, highest selling students to help with this program so that they have some peer mentoring going on there as well. You want to catch your students early, two weeks before final exams. It, it may serve as a purpose to show how big and bad we are as professors, but it does a disservice to our students if we wait to the last minute to recognize there's a problem. We know as professors, we can see the signs of a student who may um, be having challenges academically, low class attendance, low participation, um, inconsistent with turning in assignments or rushing through assignments. The quality of the work is not where, where we know it can be from that particular student. So the at-risk program allows us to catch students at or before midterms so that we can give them the opportunity to get back on track without wasting the semester. In the same vein, um, encourage students who are excelling well, create an incentive program and recognize those students. Don't just leave it to the dean's list to recognize students who are doing well. You want to recognize those students because again, positive reinforcement, we learned this as K-12 educators, positive reinforcement encourages student motivation and it encourages them to wanna keep doing well. So I definitely encourage this as a tool or a strategy for retention. And then of course, as I mentioned before, this is talking about tracking, not just freshman to sophomore year, but sophomore to junior, junior to senior, and senior to commencement, okay? Before we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna check the chat just to see if there are any questions or any additional input. Yes, I agree. Uh, there's a comment saying totally agree in reference to the website uh, relevance and making sure we update our site to work properly on mobile devices. We have to get with the times. We have to understand that mobile devices are, you know, that's our access for our students and our parents on the go. So if they can access something right there on their phone while you're talking to them, as opposed to taking an application and you're hoping they fill it out when they walk away, or you're hoping they call you back, if they can do something right then on their phone and access your website, 
you've immediately hooked them and you have them taking that, that first step towards coming to your institution. So I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, press releases uh, are a big thing. I used to do that with students in my band program. If we're doing a competition or someone played a solo, I would shout it out back in their hometown so that they would have support. And believe it or not, some of those hometown people would travel to those concerts to see that student. Uh, yeah, the guidance counselor has no idea you were in the band at their alma mater. Yeah, a lot of the times guidance counselors serve the entire school. You may have some that are assigned to, uh, specifically to seniors, but they have so many different tasks on them that they're not going to see every senior every day. But your senior class sponsor will see you quite often. Prerequisites for a class that may only be offered in certain semesters are a big reason for that. Probably retention and um, at risk and things like that too. Yes. One thing going back to advising and mentoring, we have to have that trust and that, that relationship with our advisor and mentor, again, beyond the scheduling level, but also understanding. We have to make it clear to our students that when you are registering for classes, you're signing a contract. There's some money involved behind the classes you're taking. Someone is paying for your education, whether it's a loan grant or something else, someone is paying for your education. So when you sign up for those classes, you are committing to seeing those classes through to the end of the semester. You're not signing up for a class with the pre preconceived notion you're going to withdraw from the class when things when um, things start going tough. So a lot of the times not having that conversation, not being clear with mentoring, students don't know that if I drop this class, I can't just take it in the spring. I have to wait until the following fall to take it. And sometimes that conversation gets kind of muffled or is a gray area. We have to be clear and concise with our students so that they know exactly what's expected of them. And they know that for every action, there's a reaction. If I drop this class, this is how it's gonna affect the rest of my matriculation. So definitely I agree. And if you're in music especially, we have a lot of those specialized classes that are only offered once a year or once in odd years or odd springs or even falls because of staffing sometimes or just because of the nature of our curriculum. Our curriculum could be so padded that we can't offer everything every year. Uh, let's see. I think that covers all of the information in the chat so far. Let's move forward. Talking about curriculum, of course. If you are a current practicing university director, or university professor, or if you're a current undergrad watching this in your program or grad student, think about the curriculum that you're on. When is the last time your department conducted a full extensive review of your curricula, syllabi, and course offerings? Or are we still use a syllabi from 20 years ago? Are we still using the same test handouts and activities from 20 years ago? Are they relevant to what's happening in the career field today? Are they relevant to what's on the praxis? If, if, if not, we need to do a review and make some adjustments. And again, is your curriculum relevant and adequate to meet the needs of today's students and industry changes and requirements? This is an area that is both controversial because a lot of people don't like change and some people are stuck in their ways. And this is one that often divides junior faculty from seasoned faculty or senior faculty. So this is an area that requires a lot of care and sensitivity to address but it is something that we've been sweeping under the, under the rug for far too long. It is time for a complete overhaul of our curriculum in our degree programs, music education, music performance, business, sound and recording technology, music media, church music, jazz studies, whatever you offer. It is time to have that courageous conversation as a friend once told me about your curriculum. Is it relevant? And if not, what can we do to make it relevant? This, this is something that um, we're missing. And a lot of the times when we get stuck in our box, meaning the music building, and we don't go out, we don't communicate with industry professionals to actually see what's currently happening in our industry, we tend to uh, be lost. If, if you are a professor teaching music education and you've never taken the praxis or the gaze, how can you prepare your students for something you have no knowledge of yourself? If you are teaching music business, yet you have never communicated with the current business professional about internships, about job requirements, about skill requirements, 
how can you adequately prepare your music business majors for a job in the industry if you do not have the basic information yourself? The music media industry, music industry, and music business has changed dramatically over the past five years, let alone the past 10, 10 or 20 years. So all the boards and the software and all the tech that you have to know today is starkly different from what we needed to know back in the early 2000s, the 1990s. It's not the same as when you went through in the 70s. And that's something that we have to understand. And we have to be willing to be the lifelong learners that we promote all the time. We have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and go to professional development sessions or reach out across the aisle and talk to colleagues at other institutions who have this information. That way we are a better service to our students. Yeah, we're stuck in the classical box. Um, one thing, and I know it's not related to curriculum, but in a way it is. Um, I'm gonna shout out a dear friend, uh, composer Marie Douglas. One thing I absolutely love about her is stepping outside of the box. Uh, there was a composition she wrote, we debuted it at, um, at the HBCU Consortium a couple of weeks ago called Big City Lights. It, it is a different take on symphonic band music, but it's showing you that you don't have to be stuck in the classical realm all the time in order for it to be wholesome, educational, musical, and theoretically sound. So oftentimes we get stuck on the conservatory method and we're unwilling to change because that's all we know. But again, we're doing a disservice to our students, the curriculum and the identity of our programs and institutions if we're not open to new and innovative ideas for preparing our students for the actual work industry. So those are some things um, that we really have to um, look at. Uh, a book called The Future of Music that stopped at CD production, nothing about streaming or et cetera. As, exactly. Nothing about using podcasts, you know, in the classroom or um, the difference in, you know, the different systems that are out there, the different software technology that's out there. So I definitely agree with you. And it's not in our course books, but they're asking these types of questions on the praxis exam. They're asking these types of questions on the GACE exam. And they're expecting us to know it. How can we know it if we don't even have the resources to, to give us the information? So that's important. Looking at curriculum, again, relevance, you have to ask yourself, is it necessary? Do we have to spend 30 hours on the Baroque period and we have not touched world music? What is the benefit or takeaway for our students from our curriculum, from our syllabi, from this course? Is it logical and sequential? Look at the order that our students take classes. Is it logical? Is it sequential? Does it make sense to scaffolding the learning? Does it make sense to helping them progress through the degree program? Does it make sense to helping them prepare for the capstone requirements of the recital, of the composer's project, of the practice exam, going into the work industry? We have to ask ourselves, is it necessary? What is the true benefit or takeaway for the students, not us? Is it logical and sequential? We have students in some of our programs who don't encounter an ounce of music history until junior year. I know in my undergraduate program, I took music history freshman year. So there's a big gap or divide right there as to when we have access to this information, yet you should be taking the praxis your junior year. How can you take something if you haven't received all of the knowledge yet? Is it holistic? Are we only teaching to prepare for performances or are we teaching so that students can understand and master the content and be able to apply it to their classroom themselves or to their profession later? Does it adequately prepare students for advanced study or the career field? This is an area that's often the elephant in the room. We don't, um, we're excited, you know, we're preparing our students through undergrad. We don't take into account that there's a gap between when students leave our undergraduate institutions and them not being able to be accepted into their graduate program because there are several deficiencies. Either the literature they prepared in undergrad wasn't adequate to perform on the graduate level. They have no background in research, yet they have to submit a critical statement as a part of their graduate school application. 
They have to be able to um, play at a certain caliber to be in graduate level ensembles, yet they've only done one concert in four years. They've never toured. They never played in small ensembles. So is our curriculum adequately preparing our students for advanced study or for the career field? Okay, are we giving our, our instrumental students instruction in vocal methods? Because they might end up having to, to teach band and choir when they graduate. Are we giving them a background in technology? Because they may also be in charge of the sound system at their school for all of their assemblies. So th these are some things that we have to kind of include when we're looking at the relevance of our curriculum and how we're adequately preparing students. Our curriculum should not just be a showboat opportunity for professors to just regurgitate what they know. It has to be something to prepare our students for the next level. Is it representative of current trends and industry demands? Once again, is our curriculum adequate and relevant enough to what the industry now requires, to what our standards are in our school systems? Is it too restrictive or too broad? Again, I know a whole lot about Beethoven, but when I was in undergrad, I didn't know an ounce about African music. It wasn't until after that program. So we, we're, we spend too much time in one area or res we restrict our students to classical conservatory training only, and we're not welcoming jazz studies, church music studies, mm -hmm. commercial studies. And, and this is something that we have to consider when we're looking at the longevity and the viability of our programs going forward. Resources. Do we have qualified personnel teaching the proper courses? Textbooks and materials. Do we use them or are we still using teacher-made materials or are we shooting from the hip? Do our students have access to a full computer lab, listening lab, and music library? I can tell you just through some research in the past and through some things I've witnessed in different institutions, uh, many of our music libraries are storage rooms. They're not fully functioning music libraries. So we have to really consider how we can repurpose our resources to be more functional and accessible for our students. Test prep materials. Do we provide materials for our students or are we encouraging them to go out and seek this information on their own? I remember um, studying it for things like the Praxis One, which is now the Praxis Four. Many of our schools, and I know my school had one, they, they called it the Plato Lab, which was a learning lab where you go in and get extra assistance. You could take practice assessments, do activities on a computer to prepare for the test. But we did not have a resource like that for the subject area assessments. So I had to go out and find my own materials, either the internet, or the local bookstore in order to prepare for my tests. So this is something we want to look at as well um, in revamping our curriculum is making sure we provide everything our students need on our own campuses. Career prep materials. Our students, they go through four years of a fabulous program and get out and have no clue what they're gonna do in the career field. So what are we doing and what are we offering our students in career prep or do we just send them to the Career Services Center? We should have our own area in our departments and our buildings, regardless of the major, that highlights current careers, job openings, salary placements, internship opportunities, uh, how to go through an interview, okay? How to prepare a cover letter, uh, what your references should look like, who you should ask for a reference. A lot of our students don't know that. How you should dress for an interview, okay? It's not saying you can't be uniquely you, but it's a way to be you and to be neat while doing it. And that's, that's a conversation we need to have. And then also, again, back to the website. You know, your curriculum is one thing, but if we can't find your curriculum sheet on your website, if I have no clue what courses are required in your program, then why should I major in something in your, in your department? I need to know up front what I'm getting myself into so that I can know if that major is the right fit for me or if I need to go with plan B. And then of course, learning platforms and aids. Um, I have a really good friend, technology guru. 
um, Professor Crystal Williams. And one thing I love is that she's always um, promoting learning platforms and aids. She's always willing to work with teachers who need to learn new platforms and learning how to integrate technology into the classroom. One thing I will say, uh, the pandemic forced us to learn Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Schoolology, or whatever your school is using. However, we still have some professors who are refusing to utilize this technology, which makes it hard for a student who has to miss class. If I'm missing class, that's not an excuse to miss an assignment when we have Canvas and Blackboard at our fingertips. Assignments should already be always be readily available so that it eliminates the excuse from you not being able to do an assignment because you were absent from class. So those are some things we need to make sure that we are revamping in order to um, improve the quality of our curriculum. Okay, I'm going to look in the chat and see if there are any other comments, but if you have any questions throughout this presentation, uh, we won't be much longer. We're coming towards the end of this, but if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm loving the dialogue so far. Voice class was so stressful singing in Latin. That, yeah, I definitely agree. I can tell you as an instrumental major, I took um, intro to voice as far as sight singing and ear training, but I can't tell you that I was required to take any course that required diction or singing in a foreign language. And I felt that that put me at a disadvantage because when I saw questions like that, when I took my practice 20 years ago, I had to guess and take an educated guess. So if I was asked today to teach choir, I could do it now, but 20 years ago, I would have had no clue where to start with teaching choir, let alone middle school or high school choir, because it was just an area that was unfamiliar and not required at the time. So that's something definitely to think about. Capstone requirements. Just looking at it, for many of us, the capstone requirement is the same, senior recital. If you're an education major, you also have to student teach. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the relevance and practicality of our capstone requirements? If I'm a composition major, what does that have to do with me playing on my instrument? Yes, I should, I should be uh, fluent on my instrument, but wouldn't a better gauge of my understanding and mastery for my profession be if I actually wrote the music that someone else played on a recital or that I debut pieces that I wrote myself? If I'm a music business or a sound and recording engineer major, what relevance does a performance recital have to show that I'm ready for a career in sound and recording technology? Wouldn't a more relevant capstone requirement be me setting up the sound for a final concert or me showing different configurations using the soundboard and, use, and showing that I'm proficient in Pro Tools and Logic? That would be more relevant and practical to say, hey, I'm ready to apply for this job at Sony or Warner Brothers or Capitol Records. If I did a performance recital and I had that on my resume, the employer is gonna ask me, so what experience do you have setting up sound or doing X, Y, and Z? Whereas if I had a capstone requirement that required me to do that, I could record that experience, write a report about that experience, and now I've just strengthened my resume. So relevance and practicality. Right, we only learn finale. When I went to school, Finale had just really got on the market really good. So of course, before that were things like Cakewalk, which was a horrible program just in my, in my eyes. But Finale came out and that's all we knew. And then later on in the field, that's when I learned about Sibelius. And then of course, years later, you learn about things like Muse Score and Note Flight. So it's, you know, definitely I agree. Next, variety and alternatives, again, is the senior recital the only method that we can use to get our students out of school or to show their summative assessment? Um, you know, there are several alternatives we can consider. If you are a composition major, we need to see some compositions. We need to see that you can transcribe something, that you can arrange something, and that you can compose something. If you are a sound and recording major, we want to see that you can set up a project where you have created the sound, the lighting, the switchboard, you've changed different scenery, you've used different effects. If you are a performance major, of course, we want to see you perform, but we want to see too, can you carry on a show? We're not, we don't just want you to see you perform with an accompanist. We want to see how you engage your audience as well. 
okay, and, and so forth and so on. What if someone is um, academically sound, but they're not quite ready for a recital? Okay, what about a research project, a lecture recital? Okay, so these are some alternatives that we can consider in our program. Assessment criteria. We have to clearly indicate for our students using a rubric, something written to show them what the criteria is for their capstone requirement and how they're going to be rated. Um, they should never go into their capstone blind, just hoping and praying that they get a pass, you know, passing score, which is usually a P on their transcript. The structure of feedback. As an advisor, as a capstone advisor, as a mentor, as the instructor for the capstone course, what type of feedback are we providing to our students before they complete their capstone and after they repeat, um, completed their capstone? Do we bring them in for a final meeting, go over their video and talk about it and allow them to talk about it? You know, or do we just let it go and give them a grade and whatever they get is whatever they get with no feedback from us on what we thought or what we said, what we would suggest for improvement. Finally, in um, our interactive activity, what support do we currently offer to undergrad students to prepare them for advanced studies or their career? And what can we do to improve career and advanced study readiness for our students on the undergraduate and the graduate level? So we have to think what support do we provide when a student says, yeah, I'm thinking about going to graduate school. Do we sit down with them and help them search the schools, help them look at the requirements, and then make sure we're incorporating some of those requirements into their capstone requirement? Are we looking at schools and helping them to understand the affordability, the quality of the curriculum, which degree path they should go in their graduate studies? That's something we need to consider if we're not doing that. I always tell people we give a lot of support or more support, should I say, to our education majors, because when they graduate, they're gonna have the support of whatever school system employs them to pay for their health, to pay a portion of their health insurance, their retirement, and to make sure their taxes are filed properly. Sadly, our performance majors and other concentrations may not always readily have that support because when they graduate, they're in essence, they're self-employed. So they have to do a lot of this on their own, make sure they're paying their taxes make sure that they have health care, make sure that they're paying into a retirement fund. So we have to make sure we're doing a better job to prepare our students for advanced study um, programs or for the career field. We have to make sure they have career readiness skills. Do they know, again, how to prepare for the interview? Are they good people person? If, they're, if they are going to be a teacher, do they like kids? Do they like teaching? You know, that's gonna help them decide which level is the best for them. Sometimes our students coming out of school are just excited to have a job offer that they may not always consider everything that comes with that job. And it may be a little bit more than they bargained for. So it's, it's very, very important that we help them to navigate this prior to commencement. Portfolio, everyone should have a portfolio, not just our ed majors. You're studying to be a professional. So I, I'm a firm advocate that if you are a major, no matter what your degree program is, but especially a music major, you should have a headshot, a business card, a bio sketch, and a whole press kit developed for you by your junior year. And then of course, it's a working document. So as you gain more experience, you have more things to add to your resume. But it's always great to be able to go to an interview and hand someone your business card. You're a professional. Hand someone a copy of your headshot. I think that having this mentality and shift into this mindset will help our students, um, one, to be more serious about their undergraduate education and their level of professionalism prior to commencement, but two, it makes them more marketable when they're going out for these positions. Resources, again, provide these resources for you in your department. Put up job boards and salary information, but don't just put what jobs are available because a student will see a salary and say, oh yeah, I'm going there. They're starting off at 50,000 a year. They don't realize that it's gonna cost almost 50,000 a year for them to just live in that area. So it's important that they also know how the salary matches up with the cost of living with where they're trying to go. But something we don't often um, consider 
with our um, current professors, um, especially when we have out-of-state students, we have to realize that not every student is going to stay in that state when they graduate. Sometimes we'll train our music ed majors as if they're going to stay in the state they're from, not realizing that they were from out of state to begin with, and they may want to go back to those areas. So we need to be a little bit more supportive of students wherever they want to go and make sure we're providing the information so that they can be successful when they get there. Interview prep. Have mock interviews set up regularly throughout the year. Have your students interview each other. Have strangers come in and interview them. Have actual working professionals that are actually active in the current industry they're, they're going into. Have them come in and do an interview prep or a mock interview so students can hear the types of questions that they're gonna be asked based on the jobs that they're going for. The questions you will ask a music teacher candidate are way different than the questions you're going to ask a sound and recording engineer candidate. Attire and miscellaneous information. Again, give them examples, good and not so good examples of what they should wear to an interview, what they should wear to work. Okay, that's very important. Again, our, we don't want them to think that they can't be uniquely them, but they also must be appropriate. You know, so you can be uniquely you with whatever hairstyle or clothing design you want. Just make sure it's neat and presentable and appropriate for the job that you want. You don't want to go into an elementary classroom and you're bearing it all every day at work. That's very important for people to understand. You don't want to go into a high school classroom and you're dressed like the kids. So that, that's very important. For advanced study readiness, give them again a mock interview or a mock audition. And in, in, separate from what they're doing for their juries and their senior recitals, make sure that it's a comfortable environment and it's geared directly towards what they're gonna be expected to do in a graduate school audition. Scholarly writing experience. We don't do enough of this in our programs. We need to be writing at every level of matriculation, okay? Our students today is all about technology. They're writing the way they text, they're writing as if they're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, where, wherever they're at. We have to allow them to have scholarly writing experiences. And we're going to have to be those grammar teachers. We should not just leave it to the English department to correct spelling and gr grammatical errors. We have to be advocates. And if we don't know, I encourage you to, again, reach across the aisle, partner with the English department, have someone come in to demonstrate or to work closely with your students to help critique their writing and to give them pointers to do better. If you have someone applying to graduate school, offer to read or proofread their critical statement before they submit it to the committee. Again, creating a portfolio, whether you're going for a career or going for graduate school, you should have that portfolio with your headshot, your business card, your resume, and something about your experience and your desires for advanced study. Communication and information regarding study programs and admissions requirements, we should have a college corner in our departments so that we're promoting other graduate programs that are out there so students know upfront what is it required to get into that school. And then funding awareness. Um, it's not cheap to go to grad school. And we have to make sure students know that scholarships are slim to none on the graduate level, that you're funded mainly by loans and private grants. And sometimes depending on test scores, you may be eligible for a fellowship, but again, that is few and far between and it is highly competitive. So we have to make sure students are fully aware of what it costs to go to graduate school and why they're gonna have more so loans than scholarships, even with the 3.8 GPA. Yes, there are programs out there that will pay full tuition, but they also have some stark requirements. So we should make sure we provide that information as well. Our final section deals with graduates. You know, we tend to let our, our students graduate and then we say, well, we've done our part and we don't realize that tracking our graduates is essential to recruitment and retention in our program, the relevance of our curriculum, and promoting success and viability for current students who are trying to make it to the end. I am definitely a proponent of a tracking system, 
all of our universities have some type of assessment or tracking system for graduates, but it, that information may not readily be available in all of our departments. So I definitely encourage uh, creating or developing a tracking system to track your graduates at least for the first three to five years. Make sure that you know, you know if they're doing well in graduate school, if they've been able to land their first job, if they need additional support. I would encourage you to create a mentoring program. I know I have some close friends who graduated um, from their degree. They were performance majors and they just simply asked themselves, now what? Now what do I do? And they had no support um, after they graduated. So many of them, if they were education majors, they burn out within the first three years or they went from job to job to job because they didn't have that mentoring program to help them, help them navigate going from being a student to being a practitioner. So that's very important is to establish a mentoring program. And I encourage you to mentor your graduates for one, three or five years, whatever you're comfortable with doing in your department, especially definitely one year, but I would promote if you can do a three-year mentoring program, do that. Help them if they're having problems with their first job. Help them if they're having problems with their administration. Help them if they're not sure if the graduate program is right for them. So a mentoring program is extremely important for our graduates, just like for our undergraduates. We let our graduates go out here and it's pretty much they're on their own, fending for themselves. And they need that support. Just like first-generation college students, our graduates need support for navigating the workforce. Postgraduate support. Again, um, you may want to do some type of postgraduate professional development. You may want to have a reflection, have, have them be able to come back and talk to current students about their, their experience their first year out of the program. What was your experience like your first year after graduating from so-and-so university? And have them talk about that experience in a real talk session. Don't try to center what they're saying because your undergraduate students need to know exactly what they're facing. Um, so have it as an open forum, real talk session to allow your graduates to come back and talk. And I, trust me, a lot of it's going to be very positive and very encouraging, but they also need to hear the, the tough conversations that come with that as well. Alumni to current student mentoring program. You may have an alum that has been successful, got a job right away and doing well. Star teacher, may teacher of the year, they're getting superiors at festival. Have that, student, have that alumnus or alum mentor a current student in the field. Have them come back because once again, if your current students can see someone just like them that graduated from the same program they're in, making it in the field, it's going to help them to persist to graduation. It's going to help them do better in their classes. And it's going to help them push to be a better and stronger professional when they graduate, because they're going to want to be just like this alumni who is doing so well and representing your institution and department so well. So I definitely encourage you that alumni to current student mentoring program is something I would encourage you to develop if you don't already have one. Give back, give back, allow your alumni to come back. You know, a lot of us are apprehensive for alumni because we feel they're going to come back and patrol our programs. Let's get past that mentality. It's all about communication. You can easily solve that. Allow your alumni the opportunity to interact with your current students. You never know what type of blessings that could be in disguise. They could be someone to hire your current students when they graduate. They could be someone to help pay for someone's graduate graduate education. They could be someone to provide an internship to your current students. So don't, you know, don't be so stuck in a rut that you shun your alumni or push them away because they do play a vital role to your recruitment and retention, the viability and the credibility of your department as well. And of course, professional development. I mentioned this time and time again, provide your own professional development. Don't rely on outside sources to provide ongoing development for your graduates. So offer professional development and then allow uh, invite your graduates to come back and serve as clinicians or facilitators for professional development for your current students. Okay, so I definitely encourage you to do that. And finally, 
Um, of course, a big topic across the nation is, is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's a growing topic. And I love all the initiatives that are coming out promoting this. Um, I will say the success of our music degree programs directly impacts our ability to recruit and retain quality music industry professionals of color on all levels and quality music educators of color on the K-12 and college and university levels. We can see today, we are still only a fraction of the music faculty or the higher ed faculty across the nation. And this is something that is still an alarming trend, but something that needs to be changed. But we have to make sure that our programs are successful so that we can continue to produce a viable pool of candidates to make it into these positions. Musicians and music educators of color and women are gravely underrepresented in the industry and in our higher education institutions. I've heard several of my colleagues do presentations on this throughout the year. Um, I, I'm an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, although that's not my research area, but I definitely promote those who are doing the work because it is a topic that needs to be addressed. But in order to have more people represented in the industry, we have to make sure we're bringing more people through our programs. So all of this definitely impacts what we're able to do with providing more people to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, I'm going to open the floor. We're probably right at the time. We have about five minutes left um, with the time I had allotted. So I'm gonna open the floor if you have any questions and feel free to place your questions in the chat. I can't turn my sound on on Facebook cause I have an echo, but if you have a question or a comment, please place it in the chat. And I'm gonna read through some of the final comments we had before we um, end our session today. I can say that we did um, most of that as assignments, writing musical resumes, planning a tour, that right there, is a gem. Not many people had that opportunity. I know when I taught um, secondary methods, when I taught at Mississippi Valley State, that's one of the things I required. I required my students to put together a tour, put together a concert season, put together a budget, and I wouldn't give them a perfect budget. I would give them an off budget. Why? Because we know, especially teaching on the K-12 level, you're not going to get the budget that you need. It's going to be next to nothing, and you have to make it work. Um, even on a university level, we don't often get the budgets that we need, and we just have to work with what we're given. But I definitely agree that that is a wholesome activity to really be relevant to what they, to the skills they need to know going into the workforce. Um, have them plan a tour. Give them a budget and let them know once your budget is out, it's out. If there are no other funds available. Students have to be able to encounter that on the undergrad level so that if they're faced with this in the workforce, they um, can handle this in an ethical way and in a way that they can, you know, still do what they need to do to have an effective program. Um, let's see, what else do we have in the chat here? Curriculum writing, yes, creating a method book. Yeah, we definitely need a book on curriculum writing. Um, the hardest thing to do is to get someone to be open to change, especially our more seasoned faculty. And a lot of the times, it's not that you can't have the conversation with them, you have to have the conversation in a loving and caring way. But the worst thing we can do, the most detrimental thing we can do for our departments, for our students and for ourselves is to never have the conversation at all. So I definitely charge you, especially if you're currently at an institution, have that courageous conversation with your seasoned faculty and have them, you know, bring it to them in a loving and caring way, but also in a real way that they understand that change is necessary in order to be a better service to our students and a more relevant service to the needs of the industry today. It's not like it was in 1970. It's not like it was in 1980 in someone's glory days or heydays. We have to make sure that we are definitely um, having that conversation. Uh, let's see. I'm going through the chat. You all have some excellent dialogue here in the chat box. The TAs will organize professional preparation workshops for students. We had workshops uh, twice a month. Oh, wow. And music faculty members were the guest speakers sharing on specific career topics. I absolutely love that. 
Um, thank you, Kristen Chambers, for putting that chat there. I definitely encourage you to try something like that. Allow your faculty, sometimes faculty, um, it, I wish I could find a better word. We tend to decay when we feel we're not needed or when we feel we're not um, adding that no one ever calls on us or that we can't add value to our department. Allow your faculty members to share their expertise because one, they got the position based on something they were an expert at. So allow them to you know, share outside of their comfort zone, outside of those 16, 17, 18 credit hours they're required to teach. Allow them the opportunity to grow and thrive themselves by being able to present on topics outside of their course curriculum so that they can be a benefit to your students and departments. Um, yeah, uh, I definitely, uh, Kristen, I definitely wanna chat with you offline about this because I feel that this is a very innovative way um, to get our students engaged and to provide relevant information outside of what they're learning in class to supplement that instruction. Uh, let's see, done lectures in the music industry and invited senior group to come to Atlanta and visit the first pro studio, yes. Field trips, it's, you know, you're not, you're never too old to take a good old field trip. Take your music classes outside the walls of your building. Take them to a recording studio. Take them to a live performance. Take them backstage to a concert as the sound engineers are setting up so they can see this stuff in action. Um, a good field trip is good for anyone, no matter how old you are. Uh, we have three black women faculty at UMBC and that's an anomaly even in our HBCUs. Yes, it is. Um, whether it's a traditional institution, an HBCU, a small liberal college or a large institution, there is still a, a grave imbalance in representation, equal representation. And our students need to see more people that look like them of every background and in order to be successful because it shows you that it is possible. It shows you that the impossible is possible. Let's see, tech needs to be integrated at a much deeper level, but it starts with older, older faculty. Indeed, you can't teach a class on music technology and MIDI if you are still using a typewriter or getting your secretary to type everything for you. I'm just being honest and real. Uh, we have to stop throwing new practices out with the bath water because we're uncomfortable, especially technology. Indeed. Um, just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's not going to be beneficial. And sometimes it's a pride thing. We get afraid to admit when we don't know something. So again, that goes back with having that loving and caring conversation because you don't want people to feel awkward like what they've learned is no longer of value. It is, but we want to show them how to repurpose it and revamp it. So we want to put some new polish on it. Okay, so definitely. Um, we are at our hour, everyone, but I definitely thank you. Again, the purpose of this presentation wasn't to solve all of our issues today. It was to spark much needed dialogue and to get people thinking and get our wheels spinning on what we can do to finally stop complaining about the issue because we know it's been an issue for years, but what can we finally do to start offering solutions to the issue? So I definitely um, thank you all for taking time out of your schedules today to chime in. As I mentioned, I'm going to be launching a task force this fall to start um, conquering this and start looking at some things in depth and in detail. My goal is to try to see if I can partner with one or two institutions as a pilot program to implement a changed or more innovative curriculum. And as that program is successful, maybe it will catch on like wildfire at some of our other institutions. Um, or it can be used as a model testimony for what, what can actually work to improve recruitment, retention, the quality of our, um, our curriculum as well. Again, Transforming music education, again, is repaving that road from enrollment to commencement. How can we repave this road? How can we redesign our road to be better and to be a smoother ride for our students from the time they enroll in our institutions to the time they walk across our stage four years or five years later, depending on the program, okay? So thank you. If you have further questions or further dialogue for us to consider before I launch the um, invitations to join the task force this fall, please feel free to email me at tlbrock at prodigiousmusicconcepts.org or feel free to contact me via phone via the number you see on the screen. And of course, um, as always, 
stay tuned for other events coming from Prodigious Music Concepts or the HBC Recruitment Center. I would like to thank you for your time today and I wish you well throughout the week um, and look forward to our next event. So thank you so much and have a great day.